All right, I invite the kids to head downstairs to Children's Church. The rest of you guys, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm number 145. Psalm 145, it's on page 1019 in my Bible. Um, I don't know if that's helpful to you or not, but uh, that's where it's at. It's uh, right smack dab, or pretty close to the middle of your, uh, the middle of your Bible. So if you open up just right to the middle, it should be uh, within a few pages, one direction or the other of Psalm number 145. This morning, we are starting a four-part message series called Searching for God. And the thrust of this message series is going to be wrestling with the question, the very simple question, what do you believe about God? What do you believe about God? What are some of the core characteristics that you believe are contained within the person of God, the, the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit? Because I have this conviction, what you believe about God will impact how you interact with him. For example, if you believe that God is loving and kind and patient, you will be drawn into his presence. You will be drawn into his word. You will be drawn into his church. You will be drawn into his kingdom because you want to experience for yourself more of his goodness, more of his love, more of his grace, his compassion, his peace. But if you believe God to be vengeful or or to be disappointed in you or to be distant or to be controlled, or to be manipulative, or to be, to be the, the God that's waiting around the bush, around the corner, wait, watching you from a distance, waiting for you to mess up so he can smack you upside the head. If you believe that about God, you will want nothing to do with God. You will want nothing to do with his word. You will want nothing to do with his church or with his people. And so what you believe about God will deeply impact how you interact with him, the amount that you interact with him, the depth that you interact with him, the amount of time you spend in his word, in prayer, in service, in his church, all of those types of things. And so we're going to be spending the next four weeks talking about four of the core attributes, four characteristics of God. And I'll just give you the four right out of the gate. This morning, we're going to be talking about God's goodness. And I'm going to, I, just, just for fun, I'm going to uh, give you guys a little pop quiz. God is good. There you go. You guys nailed it. You guys nailed it. Coming out of the new year strong. God is good. All the time. <clears throat> so that's kind of a little sticky note, right, that we can put on our, on our windows, put on our mirrors, put on our, our, uh, the dash of our cars, preferably not over the speedometer, but somewhere, you know, on the dash of your car. God is good all the time, all the time, God is good. That's something if you've maybe grown up in church, if you've grown up in a Christian home, you've probably heard that phrase before. You've heard that little, that little catchphrase before. But we're going to go a little bit deeper into the goodness of God. We're really going to lean into what it means to, to be fully good. We remember that the fruits of the Spirit, God, God in spirit form, manifests himself in some of these characteristics that are written about in Galatians chapter 5. And one of them is goodness. You'll remember their love, joy, peace patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And so in the Spirit of God contains goodness. God in his very nature, in his character, is good. But what does that really mean for us? And how do we take hold and lean in and live out the goodness of God in our lives daily? Next week, we'll be talking about the love of God. The week after, we'll be talking about grace, and then we'll finish up the series talking about how God in his nature is truth. You'll remember the last, the, 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 the second, uh, or the third and fourth characteristics are manifested in Jesus. Jesus came full of grace and full of truth. And so what does that mean lived out in our lives, in our day-to-day -day lives? So the question that I would like you to wrestle with, that I'd like you to consider at a deeper level, not a, spirit, not a spiritually surface level. We don't want to spend time here on the surface. We want to go deep into the character and into the nature of God. And so I want you to really meditate on and dwell in and try to examine this question from multiple aspects. Is God good? Now, every believer will automatically answer that question with yes. But I want you to really consider why you believe that God is good. Why do you believe that at your core? Why do you believe that God is good? If he is good, what does that mean for us? What does that look like? What does that feel like? What does that mean for the church, mean for the believer? Every one of us at knee-jerk reaction will answer the question, yes, God is good. Okay, but what does that, what does that mean for us as believers? And if he is, how do I know that? 
How do I know that I know that I know in a way that no matter what life throws at me, this will never change? If God is good, how do I know that for certain? Can I be certain? Or is there a leap of faith that's required between belief and action, between belief and putting it into action? Is God good? And if yes, how do I know? Can I know? Is it even possible to know for certain? So to help kick off the the wrestling with this question, I'll give you a definition from the Oxford Dictionary on goodness, on the definition of good, that which is morally right, right? Good versus evil. Morally right is good, morally wrong is evil. Righteous or virtuous, or to be desired or to be approved of. We all desire the good life. We all desire good things in life. We desire good for ourselves, good for our kids, good for our families, good for our businesses, for our community, for our church. We all desire good. It's something to be desired or approved of. I'll give you the biblical definition as well. And it's a little bit more complex And a little bit longer of a list because the word good is translated multiple ways throughout the the translations, uh, different translations of the Bible. But uh, I always love when, what's what's the number one thing you're taught when you're growing up that you can't do when defining a word? Use the word, right? So what do we, well, good is good. It's good constitution or nature. By its very nature, it is good. It is good useful or salutary. It is pleasant, agreeable, joyful, happy, excellent, distinguished. It's upright or honorable. Do these things sound like things that can be applied to the nature and the person of God, the nature and or person of Jesus, the nature or person of the Spirit? Pleasant, agreeable, joyful, happy. You remember the different places where the word good is used in the Bible. We're we're taught to produce good fruit, right? As believers, we're called to measure the believer by their fruit. Are they producing good fruit or bad fruit? Is the the water salty or is it pure? We're We're desiring good fruit. There's good people in the Bible. You remember that when creation is created, God creates the plants and the animals and the fish and the birds and all of these things, and they're good. And then he creates people, and they are very good, right? In the Genesis, God created people in his image and said that they are very good. James tells us that every good, every good thing comes down from the Father of heavenly lights. God is described as the good father in the Gospels. Matthew talks about the good servant who puts his master's money to work in a faithful and beneficial way. Jesus talks about good soil in Luke 8. Paul writes about desiring to do good but being unable to do so in Romans 7. You'll remember that passage. I know the good thing that I want to do, but I always end up doing the bad thing. I know the bad thing I don't want to do, but I always end up doing that. Why am I double-minded? Why do I struggle doing in this battle between good and evil? Why do I have this good thing that I want to do, but I just can't? You remember Jesus is referred to as what kind of teacher? A good teacher. Do you remember his response when called the good teacher? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except who? God alone. Now, you may be, we could do an entire message on why Jesus made the distinction between himself and God, but that's another conversation for another day. But Jesus himself ascribes goodness, not to any human person, but to God alone. And so any good manufactured out of our uh, ability, any goodness that appears in our lives is only appearing so because of the Holy Spirit working in us, the Spirit of God, who is good alone. So... When I describe the goodness, the attributes of God, I'll use this definition as we continue moving forward. The unending, perfect, holy, and righteous character. Everybody say character. Character. That's going to be a very important aspect of this definition of goodness. The goodness of God. The unending, perfect, holy, and righteous character of God experienced through who he is and through what he does. There's two things that I want to point out here. Number one, goodness is with, wrapped up within the character of God. What does that mean? It means that it will never change. It's a part of who he is. And because of the character of God being good, it, man, it, it, it manifests itself in what he does. Everything that God does is good. Amen? 
Let me say that again. Everything that God does is good. It's a part of his character, and it's poured out into our lives. And so, I can show you this in two psalms. Psalm 23, verse 6. You remember the 23rd Psalm, one of the most famous psalms in all of Scripture. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Why? Because I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Here on earth, and then when I pass from this earth to the next, I will be in the house of the Lord forever. And because of that, goodness and love, or some translations say mercy, will follow me all the days of my life. Psalm 119 writes, you are good, talking to God and talking about God, saying you are good and What you do is good. And so, the goodness of God appears to us through his character, through who he is, and through what he does. To get a good grasp on this, again, we're going to be in Psalm 145. If you have the YouVersion Bible app downloaded, now would be a great time to pull that out. Go to our events tab. Uh, there's some Bibles in the back of your chairs in front of you. You can follow along on the words on the screen, the words on the page, or follow along on your phone. So let me pray, and then we'll dissect Psalm 145 together. Lord God, we believe that you are good. We believe that your character is one of goodness. We believe that you have good things in store for us. And so I pray as we turn uh, to your word that you would give us supernatural ability to understand your goodness, who you are, your very nature. But I also ask, Lord, if I may be so bold, that your Holy Spirit would dwell in this place and we would not just experience your goodness or come into contact with your goodness through head knowledge, but that this morning, Lord, we would experience it for ourselves. That it would not just be words on a page or words that our minds are trying to understand, but it would be something that our spirits interact with, our souls interact with, that we would feel your goodness, that we would experience your goodness, and that we would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are good. Lord, if there's any in here this morning, online, in person, that haven't experienced your goodness and are starting to question your goodness, question your love for them, Lord, I pray that you would minister to their souls right here and now, and that you would remind them of what they know that's true, that you love them and that your goodness uh, is here for us. So, Lord, I ask your Holy Spirit would lead the service, lead the message, that it would not be my notes or my words, but that it would be your spirit that would fill us, that would speak to us, and that we would experience today. And that we would, Lord, if I may be so bold again, that we would leave this place changed because of the goodness of God that is in this place available to us through your spirit. Lord, I commit this time to you for your blessing, to hear from you and to experience you. It's in your name we pray these things. Amen. So, Psalm 145. David opens with a quick uh, introduction, and he says, I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. And then he goes on to describe God in four different uh, ways and in four different uh, places. There's four different stanzas this psalm is, is uh, broken up into, and he describes the divine attributes of God. He talks about God's greatness. He talks about God's goodness. He talks about God's trustworthiness and God's righteousness. And we're going to spend the next few moments talking about the first two, God's greatness and his goodness. And so we pick up in verse 3, and we read the words of David. And he says, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Have you ever sat with a passage with a verse like this, just, just one sentence, and thought, you know, God is, God is pretty great. Amen? God is great. And his greatness no one can fathom. What does that mean? Well, I think about creation. And we read Maisie, a bedtime story every night. And last night we read about creation. Uh, you know, we're early on in the year, and so we're in the book of Genesis. And so we're, we're writing creation. And, and the author of this this uh, devotional that we do with Maisie asked uh, Maisie and I and, and uh, Taylor to do something interesting. It said, speak about something you would like to see happen. I said, well, 
I'd like a million dollars. So I said, million dollars, please. And then the book says, did it happen? Did it appear? I'm like, well, no. Well, you know what God did? He spoke and it appeared. And I'm like, that's a really interesting way to talk about creation, isn't it? We can all speak about anything that we want to see happen. We can speak until we're blue in the face. The difference is that when God speaks, things happen. When we speak, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. When God speaks, because he is great, because he is holy, because he is righteous, because he is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good, because he is everywhere all the time, he stands outside of space, outside of time, because he is great, he speaks, and it happens. And you know what? When we really think about that, when we really think about the power that is residing in the person of God, he's right. We can't really fathom it, can we? It's beyond our ability to fully understand exactly the power, the majesty, the greatness, the size, the scope of God's creative powers, his creative ability, and his ability to stand outside of space and time as we understand it. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. And this brings us to the first of three attributes that we'll be talking about this morning within the goodness of God. And the first is this, God's intervening works. God's intervening works. There's story after story. Actually, one of the things that I do um, just because I'm a list maker. Let me just check. Oh, I can't check. I was going to check to see how many notes. You guys use the notes function on your phone? I have like 200 notes on my phone. It's, it's, it's actually unhealthy, and I might need to talk to you, a few of you guys about it at some point, um, the amount of notes I have on my phone. But one of the notes is the times that I've seen God show up in my life and in the lives of others. And it's just a list of stories that I've heard about God doing uh, amazing things. And one of them I want to share with you, it's about my buddy Jay. Uh, He lives out in Sharon Springs. He's a a good friend of mine. We were were in a fantasy football league together. He was a part of our church board. Um, He's a really, really cool guy, but he and his father farm out in Western Kansas. And he was working uh, on an anhydrous tank and he uh, was, uh, I don't know that much about farming and it's gonna show right now, okay? So just give me a little bit of grace. Uh, But he goes to, to hitch the anhydrous tank up to the to the pickup and uh, take it back to the to the farmstead after he was done doing whatever it is you do with that type of product. Um, and he uh, they he was hitching up the anhydrous tank. He brought back to the pickup up, and he was just gonna kind of grab. He's a very strong guy, and so he was just gonna grab the trailer and kind of lift it up onto the hitch of the pickup. And as he was doing that, the anhydrous tank rolled forward and went through his shoulder. The the pin of the pickup went through his shoulder and popped all the way through and he and when he pulled his arm out it went did one of those th- I know I'm sorry that was that was a little bit too much but uh, so in that moment he genuinely thought because of the amount of blood loss and all of the things that were going on he genuinely thought that he was going to die uh, because of the damage that was done when that happened and so his dad gets him they they life light him to Denver and the Denver surgeons were able to put his arm back together, but they said, you'll never be able to raise your arm up um, past here just because of the amount of damage that was done. So do you, know, <laughs> do you know what he did? He went back home, and every day that he was on the sprayer, he was praying over his arm. And he would say, Jesus, in your mighty name, I pray that I will have full motion in my, hand, in my arm And he was going through PT every day. And over the course of time, he exceeded the doctor's ability to, or the doctor's uh, expectations for what was going to happen. And now today, he has full range over his arm. His arm is able to move. He's not able to bench press like he used to. He played football at Dodge City. He was benching over 300 pounds. He's not able to bench press like he used to because most of his bicep is is gone. However, he has full range of motion. Uh, the very last thing to come back was his pinky. He could move all of his fingers except for his pinky. And he would tell me, Seth, I, st- I, I was riding, riding around in the pickup and I said, in Jesus' name you will move. In Jesus' name you will move. In Jesus' name you will move. And he just prayed that over it every single day. And now he has full range over his hand, over his arm, because of God's intervening works. Now, not every story has a happy ending like that. Not every story is going to end the same way. However, 
This is what the psalmist was talking about when he says, we proclaim your glory from one generation to the next. We speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. I will meditate on your wonderful works. I will tell of your awesome and powerful works. I will proclaim your great deeds. This is what it means to proclaim the glory of God and proclaim the goodness of God. It's just telling stories about God's majesty, about where he has showed up, when he has intervened in a situation, when a situation is going one direction, and we, through the powerful name of Jesus, plead the blood of Jesus over that situation, and it turns and it goes a completely different direction because of God's goodness and because of his intervening works. So when we proclaim the goodness of God, we proclaim his creation story. We proclaim the stories that we read about in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. But we also proclaim the mighty works that we see in everyday life where he showed up and made a situation going one direction, go a different direction because he is good and because of his love for his people. And so <clears throat> Athanasius said it this way. He said, for God is good or rather of all goodness, he is the fountainhead. What does that mean? It simply means that every good thing comes from God. God is good all the time. For God is good, or rather, he is the author, the perfecter. He is the one that pours out goodness into his creation, and every good thing comes from God. So we read on. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. Not, notice the language there. Not beautifully sing, right? Not beautifully sing. How do we sing? Joyfully. We make a joyful noise before the Lord. We don't have to be beautiful. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be on pitch. You don't even need to be able to carry a note in a bucket. You just need to do it joyfully. And my buddy Jay that I talked about, worst voice, worst singing voice possibly that I have ever heard. And he did us a favor because he sat in the back of the church, but it didn't matter because everybody could still hear that boy <laughs> because he knew how to joyfully sing to the Lord. Rather, howl possibly would be a better word. <laughs> joyfully howl before the Lord, but he did it because of the goodness of God that he'd experienced in his life. He sang joyfully before the Lord. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. I was reading this morning. I'm, again, I'm trying to read through the Bible uh, in a year in a new translation. And uh, this morning just happened to be the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we know, the, we know the ending of the story, don't we? Sulfur from heaven, right? You remember what happened Right before the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham is entertaining angels, and the angels say, hey, we're about to go down to Sodom, we're about to go down to Gomorrah. The wickedness, the insidiousness of their sin has come before the Lord, and we're going to go scope it out to see if the stories that are rising before the Lord are true. And Abram says, all right, I'd actually kind of like to walk with you for a while. And they say... You know what our plan is, right, Abraham? He says, what? He says, we're going to destroy the whole city because of the wickedness. It is so wicked, it is so debaucherous, it is so evil that we cannot stand by in good faith and just let it happen. And Abraham says, well, I got somebody that I love that lives there. What if there's 50 righteous people that are living in the city? Will you still destroy them? Well, no. Well, if I may be so bold, guys, what about 45? Okay, for the sake of the 45, we'll spare the city. Okay, let me just run this by you. I'm just thinking out loud here. What about 40? Okay, for the sake of the 40. What about 30 for the sake of the 30? What about 20 for the sake of the 20? What about 10? Will you still destroy the entire city if there's 10 righteous people that are living there? No, for the sake of the 10, we'll spare the city. So they get down there, can't even find 10, guys. Can't even find 10, but they find Lot. And they find his family. And what do they do? They don't destroy the righteous with the wicked. They lead Lot and his wife. <clears throat> we call her uh, Salty. <laughs> Sandy. What is Sandy? 
We, oh, we don't know her name. So we, we never get her name, but she uh, turns around and turns into a pillar of salt because she disobeys the word of the Lord. Uh, however, they are escorted out of the city. Why? Because God is compassionate to the righteous. He wasn't going to treat the wicked and the righteous the same way. That wasn't in his nature. That wasn't in his character. He is slow to anger and rich in love. Another way of saying that is God is good. Amen? All the time? <laughs> The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger. He's rich in love. He doesn't treat the righteous and the wicked the same way. And so for the sake of Lot and his family, he sends the, his ministering angels down to escort them out to safety before he destroys the city. He is rich in, in compassion. He is slow to anger. He is rich in love. The Lord is good to all. What do we read in the New Testament? It rains on the righteous and the unrighteous. And we read that as a, I always read that a, a little bit differently. We read that as a condom, as, as there's, there's bad things that happen to good people and to bad people. But I don't know about you, but we kind of like rain around here, don't we? And so it kind of just reminds me, the flip side of the coin is true. People who don't follow God also experience good things. People who turn away from God also experience good things because God is good to all, and he has come that all would have eternal life. He is compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord, and your faithful people extol you. This reminds us of the second aspect of God, and that is his good and his perfect gifts. The problem is that these good and perfect gifts don't always show up like we would like them to. Amen? Sometimes, well, that was a little weak, guys. Let's try that again. Sometimes God's good and perfect gifts don't show up like we would like them to. They're not wrapped up in the way that we would like them to be wrapped up. Amen? Amen. Sometimes God's good and perfect gifts show up as a, t as a season of refinement. Sometimes God's good and perfect gifts show up as a season of trial. Sometimes God's good and perfect gifts show up wrapped in a difficult life situation that he will use for his glory and for your good if you simply give it to him. Can I give you an example? The J story gets me choked up. This one, I might have to have one of y'all come up and finish the message, all right? Can I do that? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> About... A couple years ago, uh, Taylor and I were living in my parents' house, and we, uh, we lost our first baby, and uh, through a, a miscarriage, he was about 20 weeks along, and in that moment, I asked the question that all of us ask when we go through a difficult situation, can I trust God's goodness? Because my circumstances are saying that something is happening here, and it's not good, and I don't know why, and so I go to God, and I say, God... You said that you're good. Your word says that you're good. I have experienced your goodness, but right now I'm experiencing something that doesn't line up with what I know to be true, and so you need to remind me of what I know is true. Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. Have we been here before, church? Yes. And some good things came out of that bad situation, and I thought, okay, we're through this. And then Taylor and I try again. Another miscarriage. I said, God, you're good. I know you're good. What the heck is going on here? He says, I have good things in store for you. You can trust me. Okay. All right. Get pregnant again. Boom. Third miscarriage. Okay, God. And he has said to me, since I've looked back in those situations, he said, Seth, in that moment, number one, you'll see your babies. <laughs> Number two, in this moment, this is a time where I can use it if you give it to me to refine your faith. Because there's things, Seth, that James talks about. Blessed are those who go through trials and persecutions of many kinds because the testing of their faith will produce perseverance. Okay, 
What does that mean? Well, that word testing, that word testing is the image of a refiner heating up the, the, the metal that he's working with, whether it's silver, gold, or bronze, so hot that the, this, the junk rises to the surface so that it can be scraped away, and then he allows it to cool, and then he heats it up again so that he can scrape away the dross, the impurities, the imperfections, so that he will have a purely perfect, totally refined piece of metal to work with when he makes his jewelry or whatever the case may be. In that moment, Moment, God was he allowing heat into my life to bring up some junk that needed to be scraped away. And one of the aspects that he brought up was the fact that I am a controlling person. And you know how he allowed me to come to that conclusion? He brought me to that conclusion. He handed me a card that reminded me that I'm not in control. How many, how, can I control that situation? Can I fix what's going on? Can I bring that baby back? Can I fix the thing that's going on? Can I control that? Absolutely not. So the good and perfect gift that God brought me to in through that situation was the fact that there was an aspect of my life where I needed to relinquish control. And he allowed that situation, he, he used it to refine me by handing me and allowing me and Taylor and I to go through a difficult situation to show me that I can't control everything all the time but that I needed to be trusting. I needed to trust him and to trust his goodness and to trust his mercy. Now, I can't cookie cutter every situation that you guys will go through, but I know this for a fact, that when we get to a situation, get to a place, when we start going into a season of life where life gets difficult, if we commit every aspect, if we commit every situation of our life to God, we go to God and we say, God, this is too difficult for me to bear. I don't know where the goodness is in it. I don't know how your mercy is going to show up, and so I'm going to give it to you. He will use it for his glory and for your good. I don't know how it's going to end, but I know for a fact that God is good. Why? Because it's a part of his character. It's a part of his nature. It's a part of who he is, and it's a part of what he does. And so you can take any and every situation, no matter how difficult, no matter how painful, you can present it to him, and he will use it. He will refine it. He will use it for your glory for his glory and for your good. And that good and perfect gift, you may not recognize that it even showed up until years later. God is good? All the time? St. Basil said it this way. He says, it's impossible to verbally describe the sweetness of honey to one who has never tasted honey. So the goodness of God cannot be clearly communicated by way of teaching it if we ourselves are not able to penetrate into the goodness of God by our own experience. So what does that mean? Well, it means that I can't teach you how good God is. You know who can teach you how good God is? God. And you know how you sit at the feet of God and allow him to pour into you his goodness? You sit with his word every day. You sit in prayer every day. You sit in worship every day, whether it's through song or through preaching or through teaching or through whatever avenue it is that you worship. You sit at the feet of God with his word and with prayer and with worship and with thanksgiving and with praise, and you allow him to distill his goodness into your life. There's no way to experience it other than to experience it. I can't describe it for you any better than I can describe to you how sweet honey is. You just have to go and taste it for yourself. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Sit at his feet every day and allow him to wash his goodness over you. That's not something I can do for you. That's something that you will just have to do for yourself. And I assure you, you will not be disappointed. And for some seasons, it may be just taking the junk to God and saying, God, I can't do this alone. I need you today. This thing is too hard for me. This thing is too difficult. It's too painful. And so I give it to you and I praise you because I know that you're good and I know you th that you're worthy of it. And so you sit with his word, you sit in prayer, you sit in worship, and you allow God to, to, to pour over his goodness over your life. Number three, we read, they tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all people may know of the mighty acts of your glorious 
and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all people may know the mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Where do we see that portrayed for us most clearly? On the cross. The glory of your kingdom, the might of God, that they may know your mighty acts and the splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom endures. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. And so we see God's glory. We see God's goodness, rather, through his intervening works. We see and experience God's goodness through his good and perfect gifts, even if they don't show up like we think they should. And we see God's kingdom most, or God's glory, God's goodness most clearly articulated to us through his perfect and holy and refining and redeeming sacrifice of Christ. And so, if I may, whenever we begin to question God's goodness, whenever we begin to question God's love for us, whenever we begin to go through those difficult situations like the one that I described, like getting a hitch pin shoved through your arm, like whatever you, insert whatever difficult situation you may be going through. I don't need to fill in that blank for you. I'm sure each and every one of us has gone through, is going through, or will be going through shortly a difficult season of life. Whenever we get into those situations, we need an anchor. We need something that's going to ground us, to remind us, to, 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 to allow us to remember and to meditate on that thing that's going to keep our feet attached to the ground and remind us of God's perfect and perfect goodness in our lives. And we need to look no further than right there. Anytime we begin to question God's goodness, anytime we begin to, to, to waffle or to, to wax or to wane, maybe God's not as good as I thought he was. Maybe God's not as holy. Maybe God doesn't love me as much as I thought he did. Maybe God doesn't, whatever the case may be, whatever question Satan may be lobbing at you, all you have to do is say the cross reminds me of God's goodness. The cross reminds me of God's love. The cross reminds me of God's favor poured out on us through the cross, through the sacrifice, through the blood of Jesus. Anytime I question God's goodness, I say, God, remind me of your goodness. And I wear this necklace, this black cross necklace, and it reminds me. I I feel it through my shirt sometimes, and it reminds me that God is good, that his favor has been showered on us, that we can trust in his goodness, that we can trust in his favor, that we can trust in his love. He hasn't withheld any good thing from us up to and including his very own son. And so we can remember God's goodness through his intervening works, the time where he showed up in our lives and take an unmovable situation and shoved it in the other direction. We can remember God's goodness by the good and perfect gifts that he's given us, the small ones including our family, our church, our community, our, the financial blessings that he's entrusted to us, our jobs, our kids, whatever the case may be, the fact that he's taken terrible life situations and used them for his glory and for our good, everything that God has given us is good. And we can remember his perfect sacrifice that will ground us if we lose track of everything else if we forget his works, if we forget his good gifts, we can never forget the cross and we'll always be reminded of his perfect sacrifice and his goodness. John Calvin said it this way, joy is the quiet, quiet gladness of heart as one contemplates the goodness of God's saving grace in Christ Jesus. We can have joy in the midst of trials. We can have joy in the midst of pain because joy is the quiet gladness of heart as one contemplates. We consider, we, we meditate on the goodness of God through the saving grace of Jesus. And so we come back to our question, is God good? If he is good, how do I know? Might I posit two things to consider? Number one, our head knowledge the ideas, the concepts, 
the scriptures that we discussed this morning. These are all head knowledge. These are all things that we can look back on and say, you know what? I believe this to be true. I believe this to be true. I believe this to be true. I read this in scripture. I've heard this story. I've seen God show up in these areas, these, experience, these, these, these avenues of my life, which translates beautifully into number two. We have the knowledge that God is good, and that's not nothing. There is something to be said about what we know. But then there's the experience. There's that, that sweetness, that taste that, that St. Basil talked about when we've experienced the goodness of God. That's not knowledge. That's something different. That's something transformative. That's something transcendent where we can look back on and say, you know what, God, I believe you're good because I've experienced your goodness through, well, first of all, through the salvation experience that we've gone through. We were dead in our sins, and then Jesus came into our life, and now we're made alive. We're a new creation. So we have this, this unstoppable duality of knowledge that God is good and the experience that we've been through. <clears throat> and so this morning I want to invite the worship team to come up. And this was not in my notes. This was not planned. This is just something I fear the Holy Spirit is calling us um, to do. And so I want to ask that we would go back and sing uh, together uh, the, the song, It Is Well With My Soul. And I believe this morning as I was worshiping with you guys, I felt the Holy Spirit moving. Did you guys feel that? You feel the Holy Spirit moving as we were singing that song together. And I believe that there's uh, some folks, some of us here this morning that are, that are struggling. We're going through a difficult season, a difficult time, and, and we need just a, a, a shot in the arm of God's goodness, of God's grace, of God's mercy poured out into our lives. We don't need the knowledge. We need the experience. We need something that's going to ground us, that's going to remind us, that's going to, to, to remind us of what we know is true. And I believe this morning that the Holy Spirit is here in this place, that he has showed up, and that he wants to remind us of his goodness. Not through knowledge, not through the reading of his word, but he has showed up this morning to remind you through an experience with his spirit that he is good. And so I want to ask that the worship team just start worshiping, and, and, and I'd like you guys, whatever you want to do, if you want to stand up and raise your hands, if you want to stay seated and enter into a time of prayer, if you want to come up to the altar, I would love to pray with you. But I just want to ask that you would not hold anything back, that you would let your guard down, and you would allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you, to remind you, that you would allow yourself to go into the experience of God's Spirit in maybe a new way or maybe an old way that you need to be reminded of. But there's some this morning that, that I believe God wants to show up and wants to minister to in a powerful way this morning by reminding you, reminding us of his goodness. And so I don't really have a, a plan. Again, God's working on control with me. But I believe that the Holy Spirit is here. And so let's just go to, let's just go to the Lord together and experience his goodness through the singing of, of this song, It Is Well With My Soul.